here, um, as well as our faculty responses. This is our last day of studio. <laughs> so there are a lot of the souls on the upper levels. Um, and so I just want to say thank you to them for taking the time out of their busy schedule to also join in this conversation, which has a lot to do with what people are um, pursuing um, in those upper levels of the studio. Mark um, Wigley likes to say it's no, it, you know, it's no accident that literally the studios and Avery are suspended above the library. You know, and part of the goal, I think that the impetus of this conference is to understand, or this conversation is really to understand, you know, the impact of, um, of research on um, design, pedagogy, and culture. Uh, and I think it's something that has really not been interrogated thoroughly enough, even though it seems to have seeped into all facets um, of architectural de dedication. So I do want to thank, uh, Dean Wigley for the funds um, for providing uh, providing the funds to hold this first in a series of conversations about architectural research, and I want to express my gratitude to Gavin Browning and Paul yeah, for all of their help and working with the AAR cohort this year in putting together um, this event. So thank you very much. Um, I, I wanted to say I received an email this morning um, that one of my colleagues had passed away, Moji Barakula. Uh, know that, and Moji was actually a very critical voice in the beginning of um, this program. She worked with um, she worked with uh, students in the second and third year, um, and um, she was an extraordinary thinker. Uh, brought a wealth of knowledge to it's exactly the conversations that we're going to to have um, this afternoon, and um, I think um, her spirit will be missed, but. The spirit of her um, contributions to the program will not, certainly not be forgotten. So I just wanted to add that um, before I get started. Um, so while in the Advanced Architectural Research Program here at GSAP, post-professional students undertake an applied architectural research project <coughs> developed over the course of an academic year. <coughs> now what's interesting, most people don't realize this, was this program was initiated in 2007 by a group of advanced architects. Design. Their acronyms are AAD. This is AAR. Also, initially, they always called it AAD Plus, <laughs> was what they called it. And so they, these were students who, after completing a, the three year um, post professional studies, wished to expand an additional year crafting an independent research project, one that was initially defined as applied research. And that's sort of what literally came with the description of the program. So with the caveat of applied in mind, this would mean that their research outcomes would not be the equivalent, in the equivalent of a master's thesis, where students seek to prove mastery of a discipline by synthesizing knowledge of its areas into a single architectural design project. Instead, through diverse research trajectories, AAR students take up a particular territory within architecture, a site order and condition, a pedagogical method in education or design method of practice, a technological process or social, cultural, or political issue challenging the discipline. In the course of working with their advisors, meeting with architects, scholars, and researchers, the students learn about their research topics, history, and within the field as they deploy methods from architecture as well as from other disciplines. They test their topics, conceptual, and material limits into, in order to create new knowledge and to formulate a platform for the public dissemination of their research. And that is one caveat of AAR. It's like, who is this for? It isn't just for your own self application but it's actually meant to somehow go out into the world. So over the course of the evolution of the program, <clears throat> however, one curious point of contention has consistently arisen in our group critiques and discussions. Can one do research in architecture? It would seem that the coupling of applied with architecture, or most succinctly than the invention of applied architecture and research, forges uneasy alliances and incites cross-border skirmishes. Hence the aptly chosen title for this conference by this year's AAR co cohort, Conflict of Interest. This afternoon's conversations will interrogate the methods, value, and status of research, applied or otherwise, within the discipline. Each of our four pairings of a presenter and respondent have been brought together to address some critical question encountered by the AAR students over the course 
of the research year, a point each student will articulate in his or her introduction panelists. But more generally, I'd like to make a couple of points about the nature of research in architecture and in the university that, we, that might be addressed during our concluding roundtable. One point to consider in the course of our deliberations this afternoon is why have research methods become an integral part of architectural design education? I would speculate that perhaps one outcome of this is what that it is one outcome of perhaps of the introduction of the computer as a tool in architectural design. One most often characterized by the two decade long evolution of digital modes of representation and form making. So this I think has actually been understood within architecture, the impact of the computer in that regard. However, I would argue that these same machines have also provided instant access via the internet to a dizzying amount of information stored in virtual archives, databases, websites, and so forth, all available to the students at the click of the mouse. It should be noted that around the same time in the mid-90s that Bernard Schumi pioneered the paperless studio here at PSAP, Rim Home House inaugurated the multi-year research studio project on the city at the GSD. Research in architecture is not new. One can trace a, trace a genealogy of Rim's research projects to uh, Yale's famous research studios whose documentation was presented in learning from Las Vegas. The progenitors of these can be traced further back to the research experiments of the Smithsons and the Eames in the 50s and 60s, as Kaziz Cornelis has surveyed in an excellent essay published in the Journal of Architectural Education. It's nice to quote J.A.E. <laughs> at some point, which never happens. And, and I can so, exactly explain why. Two-term board now. To um, um, In his fascinating study entitled, Is There Research in the Studio? Uh, which itself incited an interesting set of responses from David Gisson and um, Mark Gage at Yale. I mean, it was a really fascinating conversation about where research should be positioned or should it not be in, in the studio. Um, so Kaziz also notes that JAE's founding in the post-war 50s established a journal in architectural education in order to boost the field's authority and longevity. JAE's peer review structure would validate architecture as a discipline in, modern, in the modern American research university so that architectural academics could tap into research funds being distributed by the newly state, established state <coughs> foundations. foundation, so <laughs> the, the larger structures. So this brings me to my second point, that we should think about how the state-sponsored techno-research culture of the post-war period has evolved into the current academic climate a STEM mania, that is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, that have become the new uh, quadrivium of the corporate university. Perhaps this research creep into all facets of academic work has been spurred by the so-called knowledge economy. But it is also a consequence of the university's dogged pursuit of research funds from any and all corporate and state sponsors. But where will all this research take us? In a column penned for the Gray Lady a couple of weeks ago, David Brooks speculated that if the future of the university is in practical knowledge, right, or changing the managerial elite, perhaps, um, then in order for our students to rise in this knowledge economy, then we should be teaching them, he opines, the practical moral wisdom of being, quote, assertive at a meeting, end quote, or how to disagree pleasantly, end quote. This does not. However, I think our AAR students, their GSAT peers, and architecture students in general have other things on their minds, and through their research, we can detect an earnest effort to understand and build thoughtfully in a rapid, rapidly changing, globalized world. So here's what they've been up to. Ernesto, Ernesto Silva has undertaken a research project on the current status of advanced architectural studios in U.S. universities to ascertain whether a speculative practice in architectural pedagogy still exists. Emmanuel Adamasu has developed a web-based archive that documents the typologies, the history of urban development, and forms of interaction of the largest market in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, known as the Mercado. The website also functions as a platform of negotiation for its various stakeholders. Through a series of material experimentations, Carolina Ile has investigated the cultural value of deterioration in concrete's use 
techniques in architecture in order to develop what she describes as a non-accumulative, non-pejorative definition of decay. And Luis Casanova's Blanco has researched how New York City's evolving laws that regulate the housing of the homeless has also produced an architecture of the bare minimum for the socio-spatially dispossessed. So we will begin with Ernesto. Um, 
That's, this is a question that's existed forever. This is the, the founding of Rice had the, the um, director of the, oh, there's an there is. That's William Ward Watkin, who's the director of the School of Architecture, also built the campus for Crown, was part of the founding of the university 100 years ago. This question existed then, and the question has always existed within architectural education. It's more acute now, I think, that um, the, the question of, of to what extent uh, the Architectural Academy is a space unto itself and to what extent it's feeding into practices and, and what practice means, I think, is part of this question. Um, I think that, uh, to quote another New York Times article, one that was maybe a little more favorable or interesting, was Frank Bruni's piece in last Sunday's Times on the um, questioning the mission of college where he was talking about the pressures, especially on state-funded universities, focusing primarily on the University of Texas um, pressures, but generally on pressures of universities to be more pragmatic in their thinking. And I think that's also something that has to come to play when talking about questions of research in the academy today, um, and, and realizing that institutions like Columbia and Rice are actually quite lucky when it comes to um, support of, of uh, what research can be and the breadth of research. So uh, yet another challenge, I think, for architectural research is the contemporary sort of, um, let's say, a milieu of contemporary indecisiveness that pervades. And I think that goes in part to what Mabel was talking about in terms of the sort of availability of information. I think that there's, um, we've grown into a culture of accumulation of information as opposed to discernment. This is a painting by Ed Rocher, whom I like quite a lot as a painter, but this uh, painting that disturbs me slightly because it's a painting that was chosen by the Obamas when they were asked to choose for <laughs> <laughs> the National Gallery um, to be in the White House just as they chose. And I think it's really a little bit unfortunate because it's um, obviously it sort of perfectly um, shows the idea of this question of, of um, indecisiveness. So all of this sort of all of these sort of um, questions of sort of defining architecture and, and architecture's place research right now leads to uh, oh there's one more challenge uh, time which I think is a is a real challenge this is a, a Myra Coleman um, cartoon from the New York Times she did her series I think it's a very beautiful way of just um, demonstrating what we all feel which is that there isn't enough time for real research there isn't enough time to go through all the material that we have available to us so this anxiety of time I think is part of what um, also works as an issue to deal with so with all of these challenges I think that one of the um, important things for architectural pedagogy is to address the question of judgment or the question of discernment to help actually um, let's say foreground the possibility of, of making decisions and also to teach students how to make decisions in light of all of these challenges. Um, I think that's actually one of our tasks. These are two semesters of our public lecture series where we address the question of judgment and decided we need to address it a little longer so we had more judgment the next semester with two uh, one-day symposiums embedded within the lecture series. Um, and this will come out as a, as a publication as soon as I have time to write it forward, um, which is again a question of time. But I, so I think that for me, um, judgment ends up being a very critical um, task for us to address as, as academics. I, I am at a very, very small school that is the entire school, including um, staff and faculty on the top. And I think that um, one means, pedagogical means for um, addressing all of these issues or sort of addressing research is, is through conversation. Is, and I think that's why this format is particularly good and I hope not to speak too much longer in order to enable the format. But uh, a small school enables the possibility of conversation and we've stressed the importance of conversation as a means of um, uh, reaching the possibility of, of discernment or judgment and sort of uh, finding one's path through that breadth of what architecture is. This is our curriculum chart. It reads a little bit like lather, rinse, repeat. I've always wondered how many people really repeat that process in the shower, but we don't need to talk about that right now. It's essentially the idea, this is through the core sequence for the graduate program, but it's essentially the argument that we say uh, runs through the entire program, which is we, we want a student to posit something, to make a proclamation, then examine that proclamation, posit again, um, examine it again. So it's constantly a process, process of, of making a pitch uh, or making a, a, 
statement and then refining that statement as opposed to a process that would be accumulation and sort of trying to make one's way through that accumulated material. So foregrounding the question of, of uh, uh, proclamation or thesis. Um, there, I'll, I'll talk about three sort of curricular uh, experiments that we're running. Now, really extraordinary, but they're, they're maybe useful for looking at how one can actually do this specifically. Um, and then I'll just very briefly talk about a few other classes. So this is, these are two syllabi from what we call the Watkins sequence. What we've done for the seniors is set up a, a seminar in the fall that feeds into a, a studio in the spring as partly a way of addressing uh, both the question of time, so actually having a full semester to research a topic and then turn it into, but knowing already from the spring that what that what or that there would be a design component. Um, but also guiding that discernment as opposed to uh, uh, allowing for sort of anything goes topic. So, so it, one could see it as a guided thesis project for the seniors. So one was Jesus Vasayo who uh, looked at the relationship between documentary photography and realism and ended up doing a project uh, focused on Houston. And then the other was uh, Brian and Roberts, who looked at uh, contemporary forms of, of preservation, as she called it, technological cannibalism. But this idea of a two semester sequence, introducing that aspect of time into the studio sequence and, and blurring the boundary between seminar and studio, I think is very valuable. Another is addressing the problem of the uh, comprehensive studio obligation that's put upon us. We decided to take comprehensive one step further and call it totalization. Um, I stop it at, at small. Um, and what we've done is, is taken the four advanced studios in the, in the fall and coordinated them so that each studio is, is looking at one specific component of uh, advanced architectural research. So one is looking here at uh, steel, contemporary steel production, another looking at um, uh, unit or composite construction. Uh, three more were looked at, there are actually five studios, one is in Paris, so I, I always forget to mention it. One was looking at acoustics, one was looking at finance, and one was looking at um, weight and balance. And so the idea is that by having all five studios be uh, coordinated so that you have a lecture once a week that's together, you can deal with the comprehensive burden uh, while also allowing for specific depth in each one of these studios. I think one of the problems with comprehensive is that it's reached a point in studios where practice is seen as a box to check or sort of uh, revision of, of a project to just deal with the burden of comprehension uh, as opposed to really seeing the possibility of real practice problems leading to innovation. So by having uh, uh, five at once, we're hoping you can get comprehensive across the full spectrum and allow for the depth within. Uh, we don't know whether NAAB will buy this as an answer to the comprehensive studio sequence, but we've, we have two more years to perfect it before we find out. And the last is the seminar that I teach, which is tied to four of our lectures every, every semester, which is a, a seminar where the, the students read background material on the lecturers and then interview the lecturers when they come in. So the seminar is um, essentially a, a, a format where they're taught how to interview and how to question, um, how, to, how to develop questions, which I think is part of our obligation to teach students how to engage in conversation in our discipline. Really quickly, um, we're a small school, so we don't have the ability to have the breadth of courses that you have here, but I think that our courses have allowed for certain themes to come through the school. Uh, we have a, a very uh, heavy emphasis on history, both within the, the obligatory sequence, which is four semesters, and then the seminars, the elective seminars. We have a series of seminars that focus on our, um, what we, one could call architectural definition, as Ernesto referred to when, when characterizing um, part of what we do at Rice. Uh, so this is looking really at the plan um, through uh, five sequences of the modern plan. Uh, looking at specific architectural techniques through representation. Taking the time to see that theory has to actually be um, a way of teaching slow reading and slowing down to really understand close reading. So this was a, a seminar on Slaughterdyke that took the time to really read it. Um, certain, certain themes uh, that come through the courses, through some of the um, core courses,
courses as well as the electives that have, have surprised me, but also have been encouraged, I think, are uh, relations between economics um, and the development of the public uh, and their relationship to architecture. So you can see that there are certain themes that bubble up through classes, and another set of themes would be architectural specificity, um, uh, ways of advancing architecture through uh, architectural research by looking at very specific architectural problems. One could characterize this as trying to see if, if in the sciences you hope that a, a university might be advancing a, a vaccine that might be viable in 15 years, I think architecture should see its relationship to practice in the same way. That looking not pragmatically to, to address issues that may be current or past, but trying to really pose some of the problems that might exist in the future. We do focus on trying to encourage the students to do a thesis in the graduate program. Not every student does it, but it's, it's open to every student. Um, and essentially, the final point I would make is that our, we hope to, you know, I think that part of research is just training students how to think. And um, here, this is my characteriz characterization of, of thesis for any student is that you don't want to become a Julie Powell who simply mimicked Julia Child's invention by reproducing the recipes in, in her cookbook uh, faithfully and seeing that as a form of success. Rather, Julia Child really innovated by creating um, an entirely new form of cuisine by adapting French cuisine to the American market. And I think that that's really the aspiration one has. It's not mimicry, not pure imitation, but how do you create that space to actually create some form of, of innovative research?
establish a common principle. So the uh, and, and I think it's partly that that made that's, that's specific uh, to the architecture architecture curriculum and its different manifestations. I mean, just now with the with the uh, transformation of Cooper, we're seeing uh, the uh, the sort of you know in a sense long term echoes of the independent art school or school of applied arts and, and architecture vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the pressures and practices and, and sort of problem sets associated with the research university per se. So, you know, I, it's just a way of saying that I think on the one hand, we're not that different from everybody else, although I, I, know, I certainly know what you mean, and that the, the, the kind of glamour factor and you know, everything is designed now, and business is designed, science is designed, law is designed, uh, and even uh, letters are designed uh, in some, you know, sense, or at least in some quarters, and, and so architecture often, uh, you know, gets the kind of glamorous seat at the table, but never gets the money. Um, and, and so, uh, because, you know, we give good parties, but we can deliver deliverables in, in, in a way that maybe some of these others aren't. Anyway, the, the, the financial thing actually is very real. I think it's yeah. obviously less felt here in, in at Rice than it is in the state universities, but I'm, I'm surprised by how little the school of architecture is understood at the university level, uh, among the administration, among the board of trustees, in terms of uh, the assumptions of, of pragmatism and perpetualism and funding. There, there, so there are assumptions that it operates like a medical school or like a law school in terms of funding availability and in terms of our, um, our purely responding to the, the climate of practice. And so I, I do think that that's where the, the issue of where research questions um, have to be identified within what just figuring out what we're doing for ourselves but also how we pitch it for uh, how we're situated in the university is, is really, I think, becoming more and more critical. Yeah, I totally agree. And, and, and in a way, what we're seeing in some of the examples you're showing and many things going on around the world, really, because this is also not a uniquely American phenomenon, um, are various responses to iterations of that kind of challenge. I was going to say, though, uh, about sort of the, the sort of longer history of this that you invoke, uh, is that it's often told in terms of, you know, let's say, uh, in terms of the, the um, tension uh, between engineering and fine arts. So it is Monte Chausset, and then they look at what's out, and their eventual merger uh, in, in the, really in only in the United States, this first in the United States, and in schools of architecture within universities that were founded. I mean, more or less. It's MIT is older, you know, many stories. But so, uh, but what's often left out of the equation is because that seems like an internal. Like, there's architecture over here as an art form, and uh, engineering, and the associate. And some of the studios you showed respect for that too. I know it's a sort of very technical sure. ones and, and so on. And then, of course, the other you know, um, But you know, the other thing that architecture encountered in, in these universities was art history. Uh, and uh, which was itself basically founded as architectural history. Uh, not that, you know, but around the same time, the late 19th century, um, and, and only, uh, you know, in other words, uh, the, the monuments of architecture uh, were its, amongst its founding subject matter, and many of the key movement and other historians. Um, and that has moved in and out of our schools. And so that, um, so they're, they're in that sense, I, I, I would want to triangulate this, that's pretty much what I'm saying here, is to triangulate the question away from uh, research versus practice and like that, uh, amongst at least three spheres of, of activity and, and knowledge making, um, one of which would be, uh, would be you know, more uh, built around design studios, another would be uh, effectively technological or technical, and the third would be humanistic. Mm -hmm. And they don't, uh, con you know, they do and don't converge. I'm not, I'm not trying to draw some sort of funny Venn diagram or something, but, but, but this conflict is in that sense more of a three-way one, it seems to me, that it interests the investigating it. So that's, so for example, and this is what I think we're familiar with this, this issue on all sides, but uh, 
um, it, it's, it's often, I, I like very much the seminar and studio uh, format, and, I, and I'm, I'm correcting myself kind of from participating in some of this in the fall. Um, but uh, the, I wonder if one can also imagine a, a studio with a seminar uh, one. Because, you know, if the seminar is, is where whatever, you know, where, as it were, the humanities live in our, in our uh, professional schools. Uh, and, and some of that language and some of the knowledge and the references and so on tends to work its way. Sometimes the, you know, the sort of questions work their way into studio culture. Um, if the, the triangle is not set up necessarily such that the, uh, this, the arrow points in the other direction, no, I, think that, I, I absolutely agree. I think that the, the risk of the seminar to studio format is the same risk that you get with any studio, which is that you do your research and then suddenly you're supposed to materialize this into a design. Yeah, and yeah, it needs to break right. that. So the seminar into studio format, both of them are actually quite mixed. We also realize that we teach longer studios than almost any other school. And instead of reducing the hours, we decided to take the afternoon on Fridays, an institute that almost every studio would actually embed a seminar within the studio on that day, yes. so that there would be a chance for a different approach to uh, pedagogy within the studio at that point. It's, it's worked to greater or lesser degrees, but I think that the, the ways of saying that, frankly, a seminar also within an architecture school, I think, isn't typically a, a humanities seminar. No, it's not. It, it uh, bears the vestiges of that format. Yeah. but. So, it's, it's, so I think that, that sort of recognizing that there's a different way of addressing um, uh, information that operates in both the studio and seminar, but is more common to them than differentiated, I think it's, it's yeah. worth recognizing. Well, I guess what I would, in saying no, it's not that it's sort of agreeing with you, is that uh, in my experience at least, uh, people read less yeah. in our culture school than they might if they're in uh, regular colors. Uh, but, but from that, from the point of view of, of the, the motivations, though, I guess this is what I'm ultimately asking. I'm also asking this contextually because mm -hmm. these folks are actually, this is the, the path that this program traces, as Mabel pointed out. People are coming out of the design, it's not just advanced design, more advanced design, it's actually coming out of this so called advanced design program and then moving into some kind of research mode. Right, they're doing the research like after they train fully as, as designers, and uh, and presumably some of the theses that you're talking about are, are the consequence of experiences in those studios or some previous design uh, uh, life. And so, so there's that, and then there's the, the the tension. And I think you know something similar could be said about the forms of knowledge that are produced in technical. That, uh, that they, they speak a different language, right? They speak right. a very confident, um, uh, definitive language where seminars, whether, you know, key to, uh, to a professional student or to a PhD student or to a liberal arts undergrad, uh, they typically will, will, let's say, perhaps speak a more Socratic um, language or something like that. So, uh, so the, anyway, the movement between those different, let's say, languages and, 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 and the imperatives that come with that is, is why, what I think it could be triangulated. And so, taking a bit of a cue from the institutionalization of something that goes from design studios mm -hmm. to, to like some, some kind of applied research, um, essentially asking, you know, with Mabel more or less. Where, does it, where could it go from here? I mean, in other words, it could, of course, go back into the studio. One, one could take this kind of work and then feed it back into an office, just like the same way offices, many offices now have these you know, research wings, again, going back to uh, yeah. and, uh But one could also, theoretically, at least, point it in, in a different direction. For example, towards the engineering school. I mean, I think actually that's one of the, the, the more promising uh, directions the potential of funding it, but, uh, but also because um, that could be one of the functions of this kind of ambiguous, like hybrid between, uh, you know, the kind of half of humanities department and half kind of uh, professional uh, sort of unit that is an architecture school, that to, to, in a sense, 
transcend a kind of type of knowledge that's conditioned uh, by the kind of questions that are posed by the humanities into the technical fields, back into the technical fields? Well, I think that, I, think, well, I, think, well, I, think, I agree with that, but I would be a little long to characterize that the, the research totality is so heavily in humanities space. In other words, no, I it's not. That, I'm just saying that. I'm saying, saying it kind of as a, as a thing wish, wishfully, maybe. You know? Well, I think that, the, I think that we are actually not that good at capitalizing on the intelligence that is within architecture itself. So when I say this business of visual and verbal thinking, I think that's actually astonishing. And we, we just aren't that good at it. And so very often we fall back on a sort of this sense of, well, we're, we're weak when it comes to articulating ideas because we've been spending all this time in the studio and all our colleagues in other disciplines have been reading so carefully writing so beautifully, and, and I think that if we are able to say that, that um, the visual component in particular of, of simply organizing information and structuring arguments and being willing to make claims that actually I think aren't happening in other disciplines quite as easily, and sometimes it's too facile within our discipline, but actually I think it's something that, that we should be apologizing less for and figuring out how to bring up to the fore, to the fore, bring forth. But I, so I, I, I think that that's, that's where we want to really, that's the danger of research is that the university sees research as either in the sciences or in the humanities or social sciences, and we aren't that good at explaining where we lie. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's always the question that, you know, that, that, that university administration poses to individuals like when they're going out for tenure, for example, or as scholars, or to people being admitted, who are you? And, and where do you belong? And so, uh, but if, if you accept at least the premise that that is, in a sense, cover for the constitutive conflict of boundaries, let's say, the, the boundary problem that actually is knowledge in, in a research university, then uh, it's possible, actually, that, that, we, that we may have a little more leverage than we yeah. We think along the lines that you're saying, but I also think along the lines of, of being able to slip, <laughs> slip uh, a, a kind of, um, uh, I'm calling it a language, but, but a, a set of maybe a set of concepts. It could be in the form of tools, like you know, basically applied research usually winds up with, with some kind of tools at the end, be they analytical. You know, those tools are never merely instruments, right? So the, uh, the, the sort of para-instrumental character of the knowledge that circulates in, in environments like this uh, might have a certain, um, in, perhaps intangible value. It may or may not help in getting grants. In other words, it could be massively or described as instrumental for the purposes of fundraising. Um, but, uh, but it could actually, in a sense, um, carry with it a kind of surplus or, or excess that, that I think is, you know, again, very wishful thinking, but I, I think it's also, it is, this is somewhat pragmatic, but, uh, that can speak as, you know, okay, look, the engineer has been like the, uh, up till about the third decade of the 20th century, I mean, third, uh, sorry, third quarter of the 20th century, the engineer was the kind of uh, sort of master signifier for architecture. You know, all architecture was, in some sense, a form of uh, aestheticized engineering, and uh, rhetorically speaking. Uh, and, and, you know, there was this kind of love-hate relationship uh, with actual engineers. And, and now, you know, in recent decades, we've been, historians have been busy, you know, uh, recuperating the careers of, of many of these figures. Um, so rather, I'm just, I'm sort of saying, rather than going over to the engineering school, yes, we are like you, you know, we, we too can be like engineers uh, and instrumentalize our knowledge and, and make it useful for capital, basically. Uh, we actually did this, this, this long standing kind of dance that, that our field has done with engineering, uh, both structural engineering and various other systems, you know, environmental engineering and so on, especially with the ideas of regimes like sustainability, um, could, uh, could be activated. Uh, by asking the kinds of questions that you're not supposed to ask necessarily, or that are not typically asked in the world of engineering, but, but could only 
ideally be asked by somebody who at least has that identification with the field. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, to, to bring in uh, somebody from the philosophy department is going to be less likely unless that, that person is going to you know, offer to them a kind of foundational metaphysics, but it's you know, sort of questioning of, of the values, then, then there's something that uh, I think architecture maybe can and has brought, actually, historically. It, this is one of the things I think many of us appreciate about this long-standing, um, strange relation with uh, <coughs> applied technical research. I think that's important. I think that one of the things that it addresses is, I think that, that part of, again, our obligation as those who teach is to help figure out how to uh, help frame the right questions for students to do research on. And so, and I think the other thing is to recognize that not every school can do everything. As a small school, we can't address everything, and that's actually fine. Uh, but I think that you know, sort of ways that we could be more uh, effective, and one can talk about how one defines efficacity, but, but um, within to, to, to probe at something like engineering, but I would say also you know, policy, I think, things yeah. that you're looking at with Google. I think, again, we have a, a way of approaching problems that is different from other disciplines and needs to be you know, recognized. But I, I do think that it's actually more and more part of our obligation to help students figure out how to, how to pose those questions. And that's where sort of the guided research, as, as opposed to only independent research, I think is, is important. Yeah. Uh, partly because of what we inherit in terms of students who haven't had great high school foundations and necessarily great college foundations. And so understanding rather than lamenting the fact that our students can't frame a question, figuring out how to help them um, frame viable areas and, and sort of uh, uh, guided topics. And again, schools, I think, should be recognizing that there are certain areas that they can coalesce around certain questions and have the guidance to help really advance something. And as it's seeing it as an effort between faculty and students as a team, as opposed to um, just hoping a, a group of students can, can get something done. Yeah, no, there's also some, I mean, what you were saying about time is important yeah. because uh, guided research actually helps get to the point more quickly. Uh, and I, I totally agree about that. Uh, I just one more, one more thing is the, um, I'll tell you a little story about the Mule Center that's, that's related to this. That, um, I did a studio when we were starting the kind of work on housing uh, in the suburbs. I, I taught a studio, a uh, research studio. Like really no design, it was just research. Yeah, that was actually going to be my question to you. Yeah, it's actually explain that. Yeah, so I think say because we, we we kind of figured at the beginning that there was going to be some sort of engagement with the CNU with the Congress of Urbanism and their kids. So I uh, partly for the purposes of self education. Because you know, research. The other thing that a student should know is that any of us who teach anything like research, that type of teaching, where you're not just lecturing and you know, sort of one-way street. I mean, even even in the interrogative format of the seminar, the classical seminar, you know, there's a kind of uh, you know, payback to the teacher. <laughs> you learn stuff from these things, and I've learned from you know many things from my students over the years, in, in studio and in seminars, and, and you know, PhD defenses and all over. So, anyway, um, so yeah, so so we, we decided. I decided, okay, I'm going to do this seminar at the studio that's only. You know, it's about the mirror, and basically the idea was to decode the Fondex uh, codes, uh, to, to break them down and make sense of them and, and test them out by the only, it, it, it's not very visually, it's mostly uh, done by you know, applying them, like, like trying them out to see what they do, like if you do this, this is what happens. If you play by the rules, you break the thing. Um, anyway, I, it's typical, like these things, you know, they go online before you can catch your breath. Uh, not that it's not the, not the studio, but just the announcement of the studio, uh, in which I suppose I used some adjectives that weren't entirely complimentary, and therefore received hate mail from the New Yorkers, <laughs> literally. Um, and it was disappointing to me a little bit after that, that, we, that this, this process didn't continue, and, uh, and, and what we thought might be a good um, battle was, uh, it turned out to be a little whimper. But, um, uh, but but actually, what I'm going to say, what I mean to say about that is that research is not, uh, in any instance, and certainly in, in all the ones that you're showing, the work that's being done here, uh, you know, is, is never uh, 
produced in a neutral field. The CNU is probably the most successful research project, mm -hmm. applied research project, uh, in, uh, in North America, at least, in the 20th century. I think it far exceeds... And out of the academy. Out of the academy, coming straight out of the, mm -hmm. the academy, the anti-academic discourse, coming straight out of the Ivy League, and, uh, and is, um, is, is about all, all the, the old preoccupations uh, of, of, not, of humanistic knowledge, of, of patrimony, uh, of, uh, of heritage and uh, of, of a home, of, of a kind of culture. And so, uh, so it's even, you could call it more German than the Germans. By that I mean the founders of the, the classical research university in the 19th century uh, uh, in order to define what Germany was. So th this kind of thing uh, is, uh, is a demonstration, first of all, obviously, of the ideological character of, of research that goes without saying, but also um, of a mixed character that, you know, that in, in including, as you're saying, the visual and verbal techniques and abilities that, that were developed uh, by that group, mm -hmm. uh, such that they literally didn't just influence policy, they wrote it. They wrote the Hope Six Housing uh, uh, policy. So, um, and so, uh, in, in, you know, yeah, then one starts looking, if you want, I mean, if one wants to intervene towards, one might, might look towards the policy, towards the social sciences, or towards the policy side of things. Um, and, but I think, again, one finds similar um, interruptions in, and, and, you know, sort of incommensurabilities in the languages and in the techniques and the, and the assumptions, especially, about what what is knowledge in the first place. And I, I must say, I rather than trying to fix those, and kind of, which I think is one of the new themes of, in, 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 the, in this new university that I mean, is alluding to, not just that everything tends to be more into perspective science, but that, that it, there is, it's the sort of um, de facto assumption is, is that interdisciplinarity equals a kind of seamlessness uh, in which nothing really needs to be translated. It just needs to go back in one sphere to another. Uh, and, and, you know, we have a larger funding faculty <laughs> and every meeting that <laughs> when these two faculties are together, preservation and everybody else are together, uh, there's a lot of translation, you know, necessary, and, and I think that's a good thing. And these are diff between different research cultures, yeah. not just professional cultures. Yeah. I think we have time for a couple of questions. I just want to ask you a little bit about um, your work in Germany, because I think that it's not just stands in a kind of interesting contrast, you know, kinship, but a contrast to the emphasis of the, the National Social Design Program here, which is on argument, mm -hmm. and which I find, um, although, although it's meant as something to kind of cut through dogma, ideally, and ideology, and so mystery is, runs the risk and often seems to, in many cases, to produce, the, to reproduce those things and all the ideologies of mystery, and that's sort of fun. Um, and just because judgment and its association with judgment is a sort of weighing of, weighing of scales and bookings of precedence and these kind of things, like, it does seem to have a different goal in mind, different techniques in mind, but then it also, on the other hand, like, raises the question of the kind of belatedness that judgment often, not always, but can be, can be part of it. And I was thinking about some contrast to what you're saying about innovation and the imperative to innovate and whether it seems like argument is very instrumental towards innovation, and judgment might be less so. Um, so how do you? I think judgment is extraordinarily okay. So it's, yeah. I mean, I think that it, it, it. So it is a very deliberate term, and obviously yeah. it's a somewhat provocative term. But it's it's in part. So I I very much believe in argument, and this is part of why we focus so much on um, conversation, but specifically on the formulation of questions and the interview process as part of our pedagogy. Is Understanding argument, but I think it's, it's partly um, the kind of frustration with argument for argument's sake, or sort of the um, the frustration at the lack of actual stand taking. And I do think that um, it's the, the positing of something is critical in our field. For uh, it's it's part of how we work. We, we when you're whether you're a designer and you're talking with a potential client, you're actually positing something. You're, you're, you're talking about something that's super expensive that someone can't test drive, 
And so you actually, part of what we do is, is um, construct uh, futures and make decisions, be very decisive about futures that are, are I think, very um, uh, key. And I think that the sort of lack of ability to make judgments or, or um, take a stand is a huge problem for us. Like, right? Um, and, and so I think that that's, that's something that um, was, was something that we were trying to point out, the, the lack of, of judgment. Um, I also actually think that the, the relationship to justice and to law is something that we need. It's partly my own interest in, in policy and legal frameworks that do have such a definition on our field and that especially in schools goes pretty unrecognized or I'm at college. And so, um, yeah, it was, I mean, we, I had toyed with um, prejudice or bias as terms. Um, those had their own problems, obviously. So, I mean, I, I found that judgment was, um, we knew that it was a, a term that seems sort of um, a little anachronistic almost. But in terms of its relationship to innovation, I actually think you can't advance unless you're making certain judgments along the way that it does invoke the question of time with a certain, I mean, it, it, rather than a belatedness, I'd say it's, you know, a, it's, it's a moment of pause to assess and pause it. I also didn't mean belatedness even necessarily as pejoratively as it sounds, and I think that's important, actually. No, it's not yeah, it's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, I mean, it's a good question. It's a, it, it, I do think that it's a, a, um, it's a slightly uncomfortable term, um, but I think that uh, it's, it's not as distant from argument as it may seem. Yeah, you spoke about the three different branches, the humanistic, the technological, and the design culture, that somehow become intertwined through the studies of architecture. I would like to address this from a, perhaps a more dramatic point of view, uh, in addition to different degrees you can uh, achieve in the uh, school market, which are undergrad, uh, bachelor degrees, master degrees, and PhD degrees. Um, research has its own issues in the different degrees, but I don't know if you agree with me, but probably masters, master programs, master generic programs in design have the ones that are posing the most uh, important issues right now, in, in a way that they sometimes they just replicate undergrad culture with a different set of questions. I don't know. But, for you, time. undergrad culture was uh, already yeah, a professional yeah. culture. So yeah. it's, it's, I mean, when I think undergrad culture, I'm thinking liberal arts culture. So we're already having a little trouble communicating that. Yeah, no, I know. Uh, but I'm just referring to those moments where, of course, you have to bring the students with the level of expertise right. uh, that uh, is required in Earth, I mean, the language, the set of forms that have been. Yeah, it's not only about that, it's also about how do you deal with the mass of students that go. They decide to go back yeah. to school, sometimes <coughs> perhaps to uh, post questions, and what they find is just sometimes uh, the same kind of organization, that's what it is, or the same kind of, of set of questions that you might have in an undergrad level with a different tone. Well, in other words, anything that perhaps at the moment we need to rethink, and we need to really quietly rethink. How are the master programs going to be part in the future? You mean the post-professional? But yeah, 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 yeah. You have, you have to, you're specifically talking yeah, yeah, about yeah, 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 yeah. We're getting, that's a big question. I think an important one. Maybe you can come back up at the round table. Yeah. You just got the big old time signal. <laughs> <laughs> so we can bring this back up in the round table, which will be sort of an open Q&A with the audience as we accumulate.
we will frame a series of questions related to applied research in an emerging city. Uh, after a brief presentation, Mpoma Tipa will be engaged in conversation with Jeanette Kim. Uh, Jeanette uh, teaches here at the GSAP, where she's the director of the Urban Landscape Lab. Uh, Jeanette is also principal of all of the above, a design practice based in Brooklyn. Uh, I am happy to introduce Mpo, uh, who is a lecturer in the Witt School of Architecture and Planning. She's also a PhD candidate in Architecture and African Urbanism at UC Berkeley. Uh, she was the co-curator of the South Africa Pavilion at the Venice Biennale in 2008, uh, and she is currently the director of Studio X Johansson. Uh, accepting the fact that there is no coherent or well-developed body of knowledge about how the contemporary African city works, she proposes to start defining what they are not in order to arrive at what they might uh, considering our participants' interest to work in zones that have barely been theorized, we would like to frame the following question. How does applied research deal with two major areas of concern, the medium and the archive, in the context of a rapidly evolving urban landscape? In other words, what is the stuff of research, and what methods do you use to make the knowledge you produce accessible to a wider public? Changes that are happening in Japan as well. 
So on the one hand, you have this very sort of forceful push of capitalist interests, the banks, the mining corporations, and even the city of Johannesburg trying to reconfigure the city. But in reconfiguring the city, you're producing new kinds of territories and new kinds of landscapes on the modernization. So the idea of the city as a set of fragments that don't fit into a sort of coherent image has been very productive for me in terms of how I'm thinking about the processes of urban renewal and gentrification in downtown Johannesburg. So this is the back view. And um, it's worth noting that, you know, the, so that's the Kentridge sculpture um, in the background, that the city of Johannesburg has, has been working through how to resolve this crisis, right? So the crisis is that all of a sudden, the city doesn't look like a world-class African city. So for the past, um, since about 1998, the city of Johannesburg has basically tried to construct a vision for what the city should become, and that's world class African city. And what that means is that by 2030, South African cities and Johannesburg in particular will be like Tokyo or London or Paris or New York. And the way in which they intend to do this is by creating a series of public open spaces, um, like the one where Kendrick's sculpture is situated. So thinking about institutional construction, um, the firewalk sculpture is part of a much larger project of open so in Johannesburg alone, there are about 600 new public art commissions um, that came out between 2000, 2002 and 2010. So over a 10-year period, basically, we have about 600 new artworks um, in the inner city. And these artworks are supposed to be markers of new kinds of public space. And the idea is that the city will become a location for uh, blue and white collar workers as we move into our region. So the mining industry has pretty much um, contracted substantially. And the idea is that South Africa will miraculously become these white color workers that will bring a new kind of bourgeois sensibility back into the industry that is going to go over to Africa. So public space then becomes a way of sort of introducing a sort of radical fragments into an environment that had become incredibly disordered and difficult to read and difficult to, to manage. So these become sort of radical fragments that produce a new kind of um, aesthetic sensibility and a new kind of visibility um, to the inner city. In addition to that, you have private interests like um, Maxa Bank, Standard Bank, and First National Bank, who are um, privatizing large sections of the inner city as well by borrowing from um, international models like the business improvement model, which they borrowed from Canada. But, um, Soho has also been a huge inspiration for many property developments in our town Johannesburg. So now you have a new kind of geography that's emerging that's producing these sort of presets, these privatized presets of their own private management. And the thing that interests me about this development is the spaces that happen on the edges of these kinds of boundaries. And that's what I mean by the sort of proliferation of new boundaries and a reconfiguration of the racial geography of the city. Um, so Part of the way in which corporate interests in partnership with the city of Johannesburg is done is to reframe Johannesburg as the world's largest outdoor art gallery by having this massive, um, or this one massive outdoor exhibition um, that premiered an artist called Mary Savante. So um, you know that she, she basically um, does these uh, fantasy scenarios where she dresses up as a domestic worker in Victorian gowns. And the curatorial strategy was basically to mark very key parts of the city so that a new sort of bourgeois public will tour the city and view the artwork. And the idea of the artwork is to frame the new sort of public upgrading projects in addition to framing other kinds of abjection that happen in the city. So art becomes a major agent in the sort of renewal strategy. And my research approach is to, first of all, read it in the sort of classical, sort of neo-Marxist framework of art as an agent of gentrification, but also to look at the content of the artwork as a way of reading the logic of gentrification against itself. So what does the figure of the happy slave do for our thinking about what the city is and what the city is becoming? Um, and in terms of oh, the proliferation of boundaries, I spent a lot of time just walking the streets of Johannesburg and talking to street traders and taking photographs in order to try and develop some kind of visual ethnography of the city and try to understand how these different registers and these different, these different registers of visuality are used to talk about the city. 
So this kind of representation, which is a typical busy street in Johannesburg, is read as chaos. Whereas um, there's a lot of development in literature that actually talks about this as a set of networks and how informality is produced by sort of dominant hegemonic capitalist, cap capitalist processes. So my approach to the new is actually to think about the relationship between um, economic policy, urban regional policy, and the kinds of margins and the kinds of spaces that it produces and the spaces that people can occupy. So rather than thinking of informality as a sort of ephemeral, uh, reified entity, it's more about how it's produced through um, large-scale um, processes in the city. Um, and my particular focus here is looking at women who um, offer beauty services on, on the streets of Johannesburg and one street in particular. And it's also another kind of geography of, of internationalization and globalization where there's a circulation of global images or the Can you remember who anybody's name is? Alicia um, Keys. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so you have Alicia Keys, I think Beyonce really? might be there, Rihanna really is there. <laughs> So, and, 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 she, and she occupies the same kind of frame, the same kind of space as like the, a regular woman in downtown Johannesburg. And these are the services that are available um, in the margins of the city. And these are the people that aren't accounted for in the city visions and what Johannesburg 2030 will be. Um, and so in terms of my methodology, one of the, there are many ways of accessing the kinds of silences that exist in the city. And one of them is to actually talk to people. Because they are taken seriously in architectural discourse, um, you have to sort of engage people in terms of interviewing and understanding what the lived reality of the city is. And also talking to people in other fields, like in migration studies or social or in social sciences, who've done much more sort of high brained research on what this experience is. The only problem with these other disciplines is that they're not spatial. They don't help us understand how these processes are on lived out or experience station in the city. And I think that that's where um, architects and urbanists actually come in to uh, producing knowledge about the city. Um, and then this is another project that I was involved in at Wits University, which was called Housing. Um, it was part of the largest sort of vertical studio that ran through the architecture and planning program, where we focused on a particular part of the inner city. Um, and worked with the community in order to define what our research agenda would be. And one of the major concerns of people from this community from the world was housing. And so um, together with a group of about 72 students, we went into Europe and conducted a range of um, interviews. And one of the research groups looked at housing specifically, we basically mapped the housing trajectory of people who live in Europe and also developed a matrix of the kind of rental structure that you find in Yovo. And what was interesting was that you could actually charge the same amount of rent in Yovo for a lower income immigrant community as you would in the northern suburbs in Johannesburg. So it, it's not as if the exit is particularly cheap for, for immigrant communities. It just has a different sort of spatial and economic logic. And a lot of hyper-exploitation hyper and that sort of thing. But I think paying attention to the minutia and learning how to write past the kinds of questions that bring me to the station is, is quite a useful way of getting into it. So type, we talk about typologies, we talk about cost, we talk about the existing housing policy. Um, it becomes almost impossible to really think about informality without thinking about the institutional framework in which these things occur. Um, okay, so uh, the order of my slides is slightly off. I don't know if you can see this, but basically all of these tiny along the streets are all of the women who are offering services for beauty and hair care and that sort of thing. And it doesn't make it into the sort of CID mapping of what's happening in the city, or the economic model of the city. So part of what we're going to be doing um, over the summer studio is trying to get a sense of how we can spatialize, how we can visualize this kind of space and understand the economics um, that underlie um, these kinds of spaces. Um, and then, uh, this is a, I always assume people know what this is, but you wouldn't. This, <laughs> this is the Johannesburg Metropolitan Police van that makes a pretty frequent uh, appearance on the streets that I've been mapping. And um, there's a very sort of consistent policing of the streets and harassment and racketeering and all of this stuff. 
So part of part of my research work is understanding this relationship between formalization and trying to become like the old London and so on, and how it produces very specific kinds of violence that that, that reinscribe the kind of marginalities that the apartheid city had, but in a very different form. Thank you. <laughs>
the city, and that's what we see um, playing itself out in Johannesburg. What I think has happened is actually a crisis of knowledge, because we don't have a coherent um, or even a critical approach to what the city should be kind of the city should be for. Um, and I think it's partly ideological when the radical shift towards a sort of neoliberal solution to, to crisis, but also an inability to speak to the promises that were made by the first of South Africa, which is the promise of democracy and the promise for other social mobility. Um, so part of the work that I do is trying to produce an alternative knowledge about reading the city and developing a set of tools for how to make this knowledge visible. Um, and one of the ways that I make it visible um, is by writing, but more and more as I pay attention to the spatiality of the city, I think it becomes important to be able to map it and to quantify it and to make it accessible to people who don't necessarily want to read turgid architectural texts. Um, <laughs> so, um, and in terms of knowledge, I think that as, as you know, said, um, spatial practice is a form of knowledge and um, taking notes is, is useful. But very often in Johannesburg, I, I found myself looking at buildings or looking at people, but never really understanding what I was looking at. So there's a strange thing where the appearance of something is not what something is. And that has to do with a, with a very particular, I think, sort of 19th century European mode of representation, where something represents something. Whereas in Johannesburg, the appearance of something is actually, doesn't necessarily have any relationship with how the city works all the activities that are taking place. So I was constantly having to negotiate appearance and reality, um, not only at the symbolic level, but also at the everyday level. Um, and interviewing people is always a very interesting encounter where they are all of the silences. And the silence is not necessarily because people don't know, it's because they don't want me to know. So negotiating, negotiating my own positionality as sort of American educated bourgeois African woman in the inner city um, has has its own sort of challenges around accessing those kinds of knowledges. Um, and then on the question of the relationship between the symbolic and aesthetic and how we can bring these two together, I don't have the answer <laughs> for for that question. I think for me the thing that's important is being attentive to to the everyday and bringing that understanding of the everyday as a critical way of engaging both policy and development frameworks and the way in which space is conceptualized. So I think along those lines about this question of the everyday, um, I guess I guess there's a kind of productive debate that we could possibly have, which is that um, I think in some of my own work I've tended to come from the perspective in which I've, I've, I've studied um, more of the bureaucratic mechanisms that I think you tend to shy away not shy, but that you project and say. Um, so a lot of, I've done some work on the census, for example, mm -hmm. where I've looked, um, I guess, a little more about mapping on the census. And in, in some of your writing, you've talked more about the map as a kind of tool of that particular vision of Johannesburg um, that uh, is, is, an, is an instrument of urban renewal or is an instrument of this kind of drive towards development. Um, and it seems like you're kind of proposing the interview or the kind of the sort of pers the one to one uh, kind of uh, dialogue mm -hmm. in opposition to an idea of the map. And I'm wondering how you might see that relationship between say big research and small research or an idea of institutionalized knowledge in response to knowledge that an individual produces? Like where do you see a kind of blur between those, those moves of, of, of analysis or maybe even of knowledge production if indeed your work is looking at the kind of um, truly global or, uh, uh, or interconnected nature of what is often called an informal economy? Well, I, I, um, I think that my thinking has probably been developed from sort of um, privileging the to know about the structural because I don't think that's possible to think of one without the other because they stretch each other in, in pretty powerful and profound ways. And I think that it's also possible for others to have to come to that uh, in the same way that the artist that I show is trying to, even though she can set the a strategy, is asserting a 
Celtic, Celtic narratives, which, which is talking about the history of um, black domestic workers in Johannesburg who don't make it into their national narratives about how the city or how the country was liberated from the country. So I think that um, it becomes absolutely essential to read um, the bureaucratic and the institutional. But rather than reproducing the logic of the bureaucratic and the institutional to critique it, and if, if I think that the critique of it becomes meaningful that you can understand its internal logic, but can also read it against its logic. Um, so I think, it, I think that it's the quotidian and the structural and the bureaucratic and that's the thing simultaneously. Which is probably also about you know, the, the question around the symbolic and the aesthetic and the everyday. I see them all as simultaneous. Um, but you have to be very warm, not you, but I try to be very mindful and very present to the way in which I read these documents. You know, I was wondering about that too, because when we talk about Firewalker, for example, I think, I guess there is kind of <coughs> an aesthetic um, sort of demand or kind of impact of that, demand that that places upon the person who's walking by um, in a way that I think does raise these questions of who, who one imagines that the city is for. Um, and then I similarly wonder, well then, what's the aesthetic language of that map? <laughs> or of that, you know, the, the land ownership structure, or... But like, I'm, I'm, to try to address that, to try to get towards that question of the aesthetic nature of, of um, the, let's say, the kind of bureaucratic form of knowledge. I'm just curious about how that has turned that on the other Let's hold up, hold up, hold up on that. Um, I guess, um, um, maybe we can shift slightly and talk a bit about the question of change or the question of emergence mm -hmm. that was posed to us. And I guess that, in a way, that I feel like that's what we are to tasked today is to talk about what it means to research in a changing context. And um, I'm wondering if, um, I guess we'd like, like to ask you to characterize the nature of change that you see in Johannesburg. And what I think it's very easy for us to say, yes, it's changing, you know, like, I think I'd like to really understand what that change looks like. Um, I, I think I have some narratives in my head about an idea of, kind of let's say, ephemeral nature to let's say, Johannesburg or other African cities that revolves around this idea of shifting tactics. So we see um, <laughs> or realization or reaction to kind of significant hazards. So we look at this question of what, rap what rapid urbanization will do or how migration is changing the city or how ecological changes might impact, let's say, resource availability, for example. But then I guess when you talk about, um, when you talk about the crisis in Johannesburg, I'm curious if you consider that to be a kind of crisis in the sense of an emergency understands that development, in a way, is producing a disaster of its own, just as much as one could say that migration produced a disaster of the city. Or are we looking at kind of, it seems to me that the change in a kind of neoliberal sense tends to be very hidden, very slow, very sort of, can at times be quite gradual or unrecognizable. So if you could compare that kind of change to a kind of the idea of an emergency in the city, um, what would that look like? So anyway, I guess what I'm trying to do is map out potentially different ways in which one can consider change, the idea of change in the city. I'm curious to see how you understand that which I'm asking. I think that um, looking, looking at the language in Hansburg is, is very instructive for thinking about emergence because even though time we move from one historical moment to another historical moment, infrastructure has a way of fixing relationships over a very, very long period of time. So there are a lot of durabilities on the part of the lot of durabilities of the that are so registered in the future as well. So rather than declaring um, the city new or different dramatic to transport, I think it's more about thinking about it as a series of layers that penetrate each other um, at different moments and in different ways. Um, so it's more about the sort of dense intersection, intersection of temporalities that are made material. Um, and maybe that helps me. That's how I think about Johannesburg. Um, so, but, but um, 
Um, then you have the normal metal, so it produces its own cinephagics, its own geographies. So you have this very complex inter intersection. For instance, I interviewed one of the hairdressers, and she told me that she used to live in the inner city, but then she moved out because she could only find affordable housing on the margins of the city, which is really black people that start to look. So you have this sort of reinscription on the continent's um, geography in the continent of the city, but that has a slightly different logic. So the infrastructure is there, um, the rules have changed, the modalities have changed, and the way in which people navigate the city hasn't. Um, it's changed, but it's been reconfigured rather than introducing something completely new, in my opinion. And it produces new others, so the figure of the African immigrant is a new other. And, and it's located in a very different sort of hierarchy of being than what was available and the way it existed and the way it existed. Um, in terms of crisis, I, I mean, I'm the crisis, the, the, the crisis in, in the way that it's, it's framed, and I talk about this as a discourse of crisis rather than an actual crisis, is that um, city authorities view the transformation of the city as a crisis. And this is a crisis for them because the city doesn't conform to their own imaginings of what the city should be. Um, and that crisis produces another kind of crisis for the people who live in the city, which is more of a transformation. Um, whereas, I don't, I don't really have anything to say about the temporality of neoliberalism. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think that in, in Johannesburg, it's, it's not just about what the city of Johannesburg is doing. Uh, Johannesburg is a major um, receptor for asylum seekers throughout the okay, subcontinent. And so crises that are happening elsewhere, structural adjustment crises that are happening elsewhere, produce these other ways of migration that have, that have implications of how the city operates. So we're tied into these other neighbors and these other processes that are happening elsewhere. And I think that one of the biggest crises that face Johannesburg at the moment is a crisis of imagination. And it's it is to, to imagine um, new typologies, new visions um, for what the city could become. Not as a sort of weak copy of the new world or that people, which is ridiculous. We're not going to be like that in 17 years, it's just not going to happen. Um, but, but people actually imagine that this is this is what it's going to be. But you said that you're interested then in, in uh, I guess, undoing this image that, that Johannesburg is undergoing a crisis and replacing it with a kind of a different narrative? I think it needs a different narrative. There's more than narrative, I think it just needs uh, curiosity. We need to have more curiosity about what the city is rather than what the city is not. And I think understanding the logics of the city and understanding the emerging economies, understanding how migrants make a huge contribution to the urban economy and to everyday life because will profoundly um, change the way that we imagine what the African city of the future will be. So I guess maybe we can turn from that to questions of the practice of research then, mm -hmm. um, or a little bit more. Um, but actually, you know, it's funny, I was thinking about slowness of research or the quickness of work. I was trying to relate that to this question of temporality, not necessarily with regard to the way that the, the researcher works or the way the architect works, but with regards to like how do, how do you deal with the slowness or quickness of your own work relative to all this other stuff out there and like this kind of shift once shifting targets. And um, so it, it, it might even be that like your one's thesis you know, the thing is that the follow up keeps doing is just like, the, you know, the overall conclusion that one makes is, is just constantly being challenged. Um, but I guess I couldn't help but ask, and I'm sorry this is a very naive question, but um, I guess I, I can't help but think about the Harvard Project on the City's work on Lagos when I think about the question of an African city, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it just seems like an interesting parallel because there's this question of how one works understands the city with this question of how one researches, because I think as a discipline we're so influenced by that kind of work. Uh, I'm going to call it like drive-by photography or the kind of uh, data visualization tendencies of the work or um, the kind of uh, attempt to, let's say, kind of anthropomorphize actions in the city through like the voice of that wall or the voice of the compound or the voice of whatever the architectural department 
extended history of Lagos that, that goes the way that, okay, so African cities are basically understood in two frames. The way it's one frame, uh, and the framework is uh, chaos, so nobody knows what's happening, the place is falling apart, and the air, etc., etc., etc. And I think that if you, if you come from from <laughs> from New York or Berlin or whatever, I imagine that it would be a crisis for you, right? That, that this is total chaos. Um, but what what Michael Gandhi does is not romanticize they also romanticize Nigeria, but rather help us understand how space is produced historically, economically, and politically. And I think that once you have a situation or, or a deep understanding of, how, of the production of space, then you can actually start asking. <coughs> questions about it. Because um, informality is as much a product of neoliberalism as urban renewal. They're not sort of separate um, phenomena. It's not a uniquely African thing, right? It's not like Africans like hanging out on the sidewalk and being poor or whatever. Like, poverty is something that is actually produced. So I think having, having um, um, an, an appreciation for the politics of space and how space is produced helps to frame your question in a much more sort of way that would be useful to people besides, you know, like if framing the city as an aesthetic object. So history is the tool for research. History, economics, politics, policy, <coughs> bureaucratic processes, the way they is, um, I think understanding that and then seeing how it is spatialized and how people navigate those spatialities is interesting. So the parachute is not a rule of parachute research in the only way to come out with impressionistic understandings of what the city is, but do we understand what's happening in the city? I don't know. Mm -hmm.
this kind of effect. Um, it seemed to me then that that sort of sets up the next natural step, which is to kind of offer them a kind of counter image, a kind of that particular image of what life is and what it could be like, let's say, in, in opposition to the kind of uh, the, the city of great public art or the, the city of, of great sport or whatever. It, and it just seems like that that would be the kind of Beautiful reintroduction of that memorial, or like that kind of that kind of dialogue that the, the memorial is set up back into the city as a live agent. For me, the question is how does one arrive at this new vision? Um, and I don't know if it comes from the architect press. <laughs> so, so I, I am I am uh, cautious about quick quick solutions or or, or coming up with a new model story as a solution or with other types of think about it. what kind of processes are necessary to arrive at an understanding or an agreement or some kind of direction about where the city should go. And I don't think that that is a, a conversation that only architects and parents should be having. I have a question which is probably lies in this moment. Can you just speak up? Some moments of time, I said before in your presentation, which were that one of the particularities of architecture is that it visualizes at the same time that architecture is able to somehow swallow content from other disciplines and kind of instrumentalize them. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, in, in your research, you seem to be dealing with super sensitive, heavy political material. And in, by doing this genre, which is like appropriating it for architecture, or using it to describe a, an architectural situation, uh, we are probably in the risk of defacing it or using uh, a, descript a descriptive system which does not uh, really convey all that the other disciplines are able to do. Well, at least this would be my take. Like the difficulty of using uh, all that material produced in other disciplines in architecture. Um, this defacement that can happen, do you think that is because we are not trained enough to be able to make that jump or just a matter of also times? Which is like other disciplines might have uh, longer times to study one thing. Architecture somehow uh, sometimes has to with very uh, very few time. Um, do you think it's a question of treatment or it's a question of the particular piece of architecture which you are always at risk of? Well, the framework for practice in in Johannesburg is that you have these very short term projects that come out of a very specific capital budget that needs to be spent in a very defined period of time. And that's part of the process around how, how the city is developing, that they don't actually have the space or the processes in place that would allow for a different uh, imagination. So I think that within the sort of traditional way of practicing or producing architecture, it becomes very difficult to, to imagine this alternative. We almost need to have a different mode of practice in order to arrive at the city, at, at the beautiful city of the future city. I think, I think that practice needs to be reconceptualized in the frameworks in which it happens. So that you can have conversations with all of these different people, as opposed to feeling that you have to take on all of that stuff yourself. Yeah, and I also think that, um, I, I was just going to make a comment and then Tom will have the last question. But I think what, what Sarah's pointing out, and also what, what, what I think you've identified, is also one of the tensions, when I said there's a tension between the applied architecture and research, that tension between research and architecture, I think has to do with the nature of research that is about remembrance, remember, you know, it comes from this idea of the ability to research or look backwards in history. And so I think that is the kind of legacy, that retrospective gaze in research um, that is kind of on the architecture is exactly that. It's projected, it's perspective, and it tends to look forward. And I think it's interesting in the case of Johannesburg is that the historic is problematic in a way. Um, and that inability to kind of look back and then go forward is somehow disrupted. So that, 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 that the ability to imagine is truncated because you can never ever look back. And so there's some kind of, you know, kind of misfiring, I think, that's potentially, I think, interesting in what you're observing. And also the space for innovation. Okay. Yeah. So just more comment. Tom, you have a lot. A simple question. I just wanted to you know, think of what you do as applied research. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet applied. <laughs>
it's not yet applied. I mean, there's certain things that are applied, like the local research that we did, um, which I consider it applied because it's, it's, it's a whole lot of trouble. But I think that having a community partner and being very clear about what that research is supposed to do and how it's supposed to be used is a way in which our expertise as, as urbanists and planners and architects becomes useful to some people other than ourselves. Um, and that's so, about I think that that has value. I think it has value. Even if, it, even if what we're producing doesn't have the value we think it does, what it, <laughs> what it, what it does is, is to create new communities who can have conversations about what's happening in their community and how they want to move forward. So our image, and also the time, the time for spatial transformation, the time for community development, is different. But I, I consider the global studio a productive innovation with an existing Whereas my, my large research model will also needs to be activated and engage a much wider group of people for it to have meaning for something other than myself. So we're going to take a 15 minute break and then come back and we'll have two more um, conversations and then we'll have a sort of general wrap up. There's a